Okay, so recently at Google I.O., there were a number of new Gem models announced. Probably the one that got the most attention was the Gemma 3N models. So these models are clearly aimed at mobile use. And the idea here is that they wanted to create some models that would be sort of like the equivalent to the Gemini Nano models, but be open source where you could fine tune it easily, you could customize it easily, and they wanted to create them where they would be multimodal. Not only just for images, but for audio as well. And there've been some really nice demos already out of sort of open source versions of Gemini Live and stuff like that using these models. Now in this video though, I wanna cover some of the other Gemma 3 models that got announced. And these are the Med Gemma models. And I kind of feel that these are really interesting for a number of different reasons. So basically the idea with these models is that there are two versions of the model. There's a 4B multimodal version of the model, and then there's a 27B text only version of the model. So we will go through these and look at them in code, but let me talk a little bit about why I think this is so interesting. So one of the things that's been going on over the past few years is how much should you just use a big general model and get the general model to be able to do everything versus using a specialized trained version of a model. Now, this MedGemma is clearly a specialized trained version for medical text and image analysis of the Gemma 3 models. So it uses the same architecture as the Gemma 3 models. The only difference is the 27 billion one is actually text only, whereas with the Gemma 3, the 27 billion one is also multimodal. Now, the reason why I find this so interesting is I kind of feel that this is a nice gauge of where we are with open models catching up to state-of-the-art models for very specialized kinds of models. So MedGemma is certainly not Google's first attempt at doing something like this. This goes back to things like MedPalm. And this is a model that they basically trained back in 2022. Really, it predated things like ChatGPT. And it was something that just wasn't released publicly. So I think it was made available for researchers working on medical kinds of things. I think going forward from that, in 2023, we had MedPalm 2. Now, this is the one that sort of got me interested in all of this. So around the time when this model came out, I actually met one of the senior research people in charge of a number of the teams doing these kinds of models. And I was asking him about how good this MedPalm 2 actually was. He was saying that already back then, people on the team felt that they would rather go to this model for certain kinds of diagnosis than go to a standard GP, that they felt that this model was getting so good at being able to spot so many different things and be able to respond and that just being able to put a whole sort of case history in there, you were able to get you know lots of interesting things out from that. That led to the whole series of Amy papers. So these were a number of papers that came out from DeepMind. And in many ways, they really showed that these models could do a lot of things better than a standard doctor. Yet at this stage, none of these models had been made available publicly. So I do think that certain researchers got access to them. I think you could apply for access or something, but it wasn't something that you could just download and try out yourself and see where things were going. And this is one of the reasons why I find the whole sort of med gemma really interesting was that even though after a lot of these custom models came out, we saw things like GPT-4 come along and be able to beat a lot of these specialized models. It was made very clear by OpenAI and other people that you shouldn't be relying on just GPT-4 to be able to diagnose things or analyze images and scans and that kind of thing. So I find it really interesting that we arrive here now with MedGemma being fully open to download, to test, to try out different things. Now, on top of the models from Google, there were also you know, different versions of BERT that were trained for sort of doing clinical classification, things like this. And there were multiple models out there that were trained on sort of biomedical text, etc. One of the companies that went after the whole medical AI thing very strongly was IBM and their Watson team. And I think the thing that was very frustrating for people who worked on that 
was that the issues that were stopping these models getting into use were generally legal issues and liability issues and not things that related directly to that the models weren't very good or that the systems weren't very good. I think in many ways, even the IBM teams had models and systems that were able to do a lot of things better, but due to liability and risk, they never got used. And if you've been involved with deep learning, you probably heard Jeffrey Hinton or Andrew Ng declare that, you know, radiologists were going to be obsolete or certainly scale back because these vision models were just getting so good at being able to analyze x-rays and scans and things like that. But again, due to the whole legal and liability issues, that's what sort of prevented things from happening. And this seemed to be the issue with the Google models not being made public as well. So jump forward to today. So we've got Medgemma being made public. And as I understand it, Google's got a whole sort of terms of use if you're going to basically opt in to use this. And legally, they obviously want to protect themselves from people just being stupid and using these models for things that they probably weren't intended for or people making claims that Google doesn't want people to make about these models. But the great thing is that this time they have been made public. So anyone doing research in this area or people even looking to build future products in this area are able then to take these models. Google's also included some notebooks and code to fine tune these models. We can look at that later on and be able to use them to get results that could go on to help a lot of different people that perhaps don't have access to a lot of the medical facilities in the first world, etc. Okay, so just before we jump into the code, one of the things I wanted to show you is if we come in and look at the model card for Medgemma, we can see some really interesting things. So the first one is this MedQA, and we can see that, okay, best out of five, it's getting 89.8, but really what we care about is the zero shot. So 87.7% for the big one, and we can see that the 4B obviously is going to get a lot less. So to just show you what those kind of questions are, if you look at here, you can see that basically they will give a bunch of information about a patient and then ask a question. And we can see that this benchmark has been used for quite a while since the original MedPalm model came out in 2022, etc. Now jumping from MedPalm to MedPalm 2, you can see that its score on these MedQA data set was 86.5%. So this small model that we can actually run in Colab has the ability to get a higher score than something that was like the PUM models were around 540 billion parameters a few years back. And for me, the key takeaway that this really shows is that we're able to get much smaller models now that can be trained with a lot more data and therefore be able to do much better than the really big models of just a couple of years ago. And this is a pattern that we're seeing right across all of the models. If you think back to the sort of Llama 4 model, the huge one still hasn't been released. And I think one of the reasons is that it's just not as competitive, especially when you factor in the amount of compute needed to actually run it. So having these smaller models that we can run on either one or two GPUs and we can scale them up with fine tuning, et cetera, really is a big breakthrough, not just for the medical field, but for any field where you want to have specialized models that have been instruction tuned for a very specific use case. So let's jump in and have a look at the two Medgemma models, what exactly they can do. Then we'll have a play with them in code. And then I'll talk about if you want to fine tune them, et cetera. All right, so jumping into the code, what I've basically done is taken a couple of their notebooks and just stripped it down a little bit. So the first notebook we're going to be looking at is the Medgemma 4B. So obviously this is the small model. You can get it up running pretty easily in here. And out of the two models, this is actually the multimodal model. So this one you can pass in images, etc. So you can see here that if we pass in a chest X-ray, and we give it the prompt of you're an expert radiologist, describe this x-ray. In this case, it's basically come out and said, okay, I've reviewed the chest x-ray, here's my description, and we've got a full breakdown of it. Now, I haven't tested this out a lot to see, like what if we give it something with pneumonia or with a tumor or something, 
I encourage you to try that out. And I guess myself, I probably would be using this more as a research sort of tool for this kind of thing. And you can see very clearly in here that they've got a disclaimer saying that I'm an AI, I can't provide a definitive diagnosis. And even for this 4B model, I feel that you want to be careful about trusting it for saying positive or giving a diagnosis of something that's positive or negative or something like that. Where I do think both the 4B and the 27B get really interesting though, is with just a lot of the sort of text stuff. So if we jump forward to the inference on text, you can see that if I just ask it things like, what are some ways that you can prevent a cold? And we pipe that in, we're using basically the pipelines. So you can see that there are two pipelines. For the first one, we've got an image plus text to text pipeline in Transformers. And in this one is basically just a text generation because it's just text in, text out. And you can see that, okay, if we ask it, what are some ways to prevent the cold? It goes on and gives us a whole sort of breakdown here. And it does seem to me that the quality of responses you're getting back are going to be better than just the plain Gemma 3 models. So you can go through this and read it yourself. Another thing that I thought was really cool with this is that if you change the system instruction and you basically change it to your helpful medical assistant that guides to a diagnosis and can ask questions, you now get a much more sort of interactive conversation going on. So now if I put in the prompt, I have a sore throat and a slight temperature, what should I do? You'll see that the first thing it comes back is it paraphrases the symptoms, but then it comes back and actually asks us a bunch of questions. And I think this is something that's really interesting of being able to have something that can have a conversation with you and respond back asking questions. Now, sure, if I had access to a human doctor, et cetera, I would probably go to the doctor, but there are plenty of places in the world that either medical care is just so expensive or it's just really hard to come by doctors. So having something like this, which is in this case, a 4B model, which could pretty much run on a phone, is kind of amazing to be able to have it to get these medical conversations going, et cetera. So I totally understand that probably Google and other people don't want this being used as a substitute for a doctor. And I agree with that. It is really cool just to see what sort of questions it can actually ask you. Now, if we jump into the 27B one, we see with this one, unfortunately, we don't have the access to be able to pass in an image, which perhaps is deliberate on Google's part is that they didn't want something that was actually perhaps so good that people would start substituting it for a radiologist or something like that. But certainly asking it the GP questions here, we get a whole bunch of really good answers. Here's the one about the cold sort of stuff. And then for the last one, and then again, giving it the system instruction of where it can ask questions back, I've basically put in now that, okay, I'm here for a general checkup. What would you like to ask me or recommend? And you can see straight away, it goes into a whole bunch of different things to establish a baseline of, okay, how have you been feeling? Any fatigue, pain, medical history? It's really trying to extract these things out via the conversation and be able to guide you. Now I set the tokens here of just 500 tokens, but you can see it's still going and starting to go on to be much more in depth in the conversation and its recommendations, etc. I've tried it for a number of different diseases because we're on YouTube, I didn't want to show sorts of things that where you can ask it about things from the pandemic, but I encourage you to try that out yourself and just get a sense of like where this is going. And remember that this is beating models that were considered state of the art models only a couple of years ago, and they were already starting to beat human doctors for a lot of different things. So it is amazing that we've got access to a model like this that we can use for ourselves and even look at for advancing research or helping to develop products, etc. So the last thing I wanted to cover that they've also released is the ability to actually fine tune this model. So they've released the pre-trained versions and they've released the instruction tuned versions. But if you want to take that pre-trained version and fine tune it for something specifically for your use case, and they've got an example in here of doing it, you can certainly do that. You can certainly just take this and train it to get really 
good at a particular kind of image and class detection like they've got in here. And you can see this is basically just setting it up for doing a classification of a number of different kinds of tissue that's in there. So this allows you to then basically make a fine-tuned LoRa, export it out. It's using the standard PEFT library from Hugging Face. And the cool thing is the code is already there for you to use out of the box. So just to finish up, I would say that for me, this is far more than just we're interested in this medical model. It's also starting to show you that some of these open models, if you take the pre-trained versions and you fine tune them for very specific tasks, you can get models that are state of the art and that can be huge proprietary models that were the leading edge of things just a couple of years ago. So if you are looking to have something that you can run on-prem or for privacy reasons, you don't want to use a proprietary model, etc. This is the kind of thing that you should be looking at and testing out for various uses. All right, if you found this video useful, please click like and subscribe, and I will talk to you in the next video. Bye for now.